Father, we thank you once more for the privilege of having these meetings. We thank you that you have made all the arrangements and we're just following your lead. Help us to understand what our part is. May we study, may we meditate, may we hear your voice. We thank you now that we may read some of what you gave Alan White to preserve for us. May we see the importance of it. We thank you now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Desire of Ages, we're looking at the chapter, the Sermon on the Mount. Of course, we're drawing from other parts. We're drawing from the Bible and the prophecy. But this is the place we're looking at to stay organized. I think we left off about page 311. The reason that I remember that is because that particular quote is one that I have observed through the years, and I mean since I first started doing this, that people sit back and wonder, now wait a minute, how do I do that? As a matter of fact, after reading that quote years ago in, in Washington, at the other end of it, a woman stood up, and she didn't like it one bit, that quote. And she said, she was a young woman too, and she stood up and said, Oh, give us hope! <laughs> it just absolutely threw her. She thought that's an absolutely impossible thing that Ellen White said. And she was blaming me, but it wasn't me who said it, it was Ellen White. And I just looked at her and I said, Sister, you know, if I knew you were doing something that would get you lost and I told you how to remedy it, I would consider that hope. <laughs> if I leave you alone in your deception, that is not giving you hope. <laughs> and she got real quiet and just said, <laughs> I said, we're talking about genuine hope here. We're talking about the truth. Okay, so maybe I should uh, read that again just to let you know what it was that uh, got that reaction from her. Desire of Ages 3.11. You might want to memorize this one sometime just so you have it at your fingertips and somebody is talking to you about something. God's ideal for his children is higher than the highest human thought. Okay? Than the human thought can even reach. Be ye perfect. Ah, uh, uh, there's the rub right there. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. And of course, when people hear that, they say, Oh, now who can do that? Well, obviously, what Jesus was saying can be done. We need to understand what is he saying. <laughs> He's not telling us to be God. That would be crazy. <laughs> he is not telling us to be God. But he's saying that we can do something the same way that God does something. And we need to find out what he's saying. What is it we can do that God does? <laughs> so, the next sentence says, this command, did you know it was a command? He was not making a suggestion. He was not giving us some options and some alternatives. He was making a command. Be, therefore, perfect. <laughs> if, I don't know. I've never talked to a person yet who thought Jesus was giving them a command. He was just kind of saying something. <laughs> no, it's a command. And so we have a commandment from God, from Jesus. It says here, this command is a promise. Well, that puts a whole new different light on things. He didn't say, you do it. He says, I promise you, you will do it. How can he make that promise? There's a condition. 
if we meet the condition he promises that we will do what the Father does on our level. So let's keep reading here. The plan of redemption contemplates our complete recovery from the power of Satan. Now, doesn't that make sense? Why would God work out a plan of salvation where he only deals with part of the problem? <laughs> Why would he do that? I mean, don't do anything if you're going to do that. So God, God's plan is complete, and the devil knows that. It's complete, complete recovery from Satan. Okay. Uh, Christ always, there goes those absolutes again, always separates the contrite soul from sin. Now, that is also misunderstood. People read that and say, oh, he's going to help me overcome my cherished secret sin that nobody knows about. That's not what that says. Because God is not going to pick sins to deliver us from. He's not going to do that. <laughs> He's not going to say, oh, you have that one. Okay, we'll work on that. Oh, you have that one. Oh, we'll work on that one. Then. No, he never does that. What God does is deal with the whole problem of sin. Period. To get rid of the whole thing. So we don't have the problem that has dominion over us. Okay? So it says Christ always, that's the only plan of salvation he has. He always separates the person who has a problem with sin from sin so now they don't have that problem anymore. And he always does it. Always. He came to destroy the works of the devil, and he has made provision. There we go. He has made provision that the Holy Spirit shall be imparted to every repentant soul to keep him from sinning. Now, that's just the outside of what sin is. See, to keep him from sinning. And just in case we missed what she was saying, she continues on now. And this is the part where she's going to start with today. The tempter's agency is not to be accounted an excuse for one wrong act. So when Satan says, you do this, or you do that, or your old habits say this, or whatever, she says, hey, that doesn't count anymore. It doesn't work anymore. If you use that as an excuse, you're going to sin. That's the only possible thing you can do, is if you excuse it, you're going to do it. So she said, we must not uh, use an excuse for one wrong act. Satan is jubilant. Now, does anybody here want to make Satan happy? <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> Satan is jubilant. When he hears the professed followers of Christ making excuses. So, wouldn't, isn't that a strange picture? A Seventh-day Adventist redeemed, delivered from sin person who is a Christian wanting to make Satan happy by making excuses. That's a picture, isn't it? Why should a Seventh-day Adventist even think about making an excuse for sinning? Why? Only unbelievers do that. And I could see people actually wince when I read the next sentence. Yeah. In audiences, I could just see them. A holy temper. <laughs> A Christ-like life is accessible to every repenting, believing child of God. And I've had people come to me after the meeting where this was read, tell me, man, I can't overcome my temper. I say, wait, you better go back and read that sentence. A holy temper is accessible to every repenting, believing child of God. So then, 
There's another sentence added here. Jesus said, be perfect like the Father. Now, she she's right. As the Son of Man was perfect in his life, so his followers are to be perfect in their life. So now she has made it very practical. You don't get to see the Father doing his thing, but we see Jesus. And that's what it says in Hebrews. We don't see the things that are being talked about theoretically, but we see Jesus. Well, when we see Jesus, we know what a perfect human life is. And so we say the same thing. Well, wait a minute. I can't do what he did. Well, you can do the human things he did. You can't do the God things he did. But you can do the human things he did. Okay? Now she's She's going to make this so practical, we have no place to go, we can't hide. Here she goes. Jesus was in all things made like unto his brethren. Now, who are his brethren? Christians. They are his brethren. The, the drunk laying in the gutter, they're an absolute mess. Is not his brother? You see, the universalists like to make Jesus the brother of every human, no matter how horrible they are. That's not true. Now, he loves everybody, and he's made provision for everybody, but he is the brother of the redeemed because he, he is making them like himself. So it says that in all things he was made like under his brother. So are we in that category? That means that if we're brethren, we should be able to do the same things he does. <laughs> we're kin. We're kinfolk. <laughs> we're brethren. We're in the same family. We have the same father. We have the same inheritance. We can do what all of our brothers do. <laughs> okay? So that sense is loaded. We could spend some time there, but let's let's see where else he's going here. He became flesh even as we are. What kind of flesh is that? Yeah. There's no such thing on this earth as holy flesh. You got to A Christian does not have holy flesh. That is one of the things that people tried to invent during Ellen White's time, saying, well, I'm sanctified now. I'm holy. I'm holy. No, you're not. Jesus is holy, and as long as you have him, you have the hope. You have the hope. But you are not holy flesh. You are still <laughs> the same kind of flesh you had when you were born. The only thing that's changed is your mind. You have a clean spirit now. Okay? But your flesh is still... <laughs> it gets tired. It gets hungry. As a matter of fact, that's your next sentence. He was hungry and thirsty and weary. See? That proves he had our flesh because that's what ours does. <laughs> now then, at this point, we could spend a lot of time discussing the difference between... Jesus as a human and us as a human. Because although he had our flesh, he did not have our sinful spirit. He had a pure, holy spirit. Okay? So Jesus was not just like us in spite of what lots of people say. He was a pure, holy being in the likeness of sinful flesh. And there's no contradiction of saying he had both of those at the same time because that's what a Christian is. A Christian is a person who still has sinful flesh, but they have a cleaned up mind because of Christ. He has given them a new heart, a new mind, which is like what he had. Only he had no bad habits, and we have bad habits. So, there's no place where he was actually just like us, but he was a real human. 
Okay? He was a real human, but he was also divine, so we can't just talk about his humanity by itself, because it never existed by itself. That's not possible. He was always divine, human, combined. All right, so let's go on now. He was sustained by food, refreshed by sleep. He shared the lot of man, yet he was the blameless Son of God. When did he start being the Son of God? There are lots of people who think he became the Son of God when he was made a human. But that's just not so. It's really not possible. Because Jesus, as the Son of God, was sent by the Father to clothe his divinity as the Son of God with humanity. So he was the Son of God before he became a human. That's very important to get that across to people because most people don't know that. And when you say he was the Son of God from eternity past, now you have something to deal with. Because if he was the Son of God way back then, before creation, then how did he get to be the Son of God? <laughs> See? And most people never think about that because they think Jesus has always been because that's what the churches teach them. But there is no Bible verse for that. The Bible says he was the Son of God and that means he was born sometime, somewhere that we don't know about. But we don't have to know about it. God never has to explain that to us. He just has to tell us. He's my son. Isn't that enough? Isn't that enough? He said, that's my son. Now, did he ever say such a thing? This is the way you talk to people because you get their brain thinking and thinking. And they say, well, he did, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he did. So, yeah, he really did. As a matter of fact, three times before the cross, Desire of Ages 625, three times before the cross he said it. The Father came to this earth personally to say to the human race, This is my Son. <laughs> this is my Son. Now, are we going to say, Well, God, I think you're a little confused here. You, you can't have a Son. <laughs> That's exactly what the theologians all over the world throughout history have said. God, I'm sorry, but uh, we know you're fooling us. Yeah, we know you can't have a son because deity can't be produced. We know that. It just is. Well, that's not the Bible. That's not Christianity. That's Plato. That's Socrates. That's men's foolishness. Let's just say, Stay with God's words, and here we have it on, in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is talking, and Ellen White explicating it. She says, Jesus is the Son of God. Of course, Matthew 3.17, God said it himself. So that should be enough. Now then, she's ready to tell us now what Jesus meant when he said, Be perfect as your Father is perfect. Here she comes. His character, the character of Jesus in the flesh, is to be ours. So now we know what Jesus said. He said, you be like God in your character as he is in his character. Now we can do that. Yes. We can be more than sincere, we can be committed. We can decide and never bend. Your character is the only thing that's going to take you to heaven. Did you know that? There's nothing else about you that's going to heaven except your character. And you cannot have your character given to you. Oh, there was a fellow who got so upset with me when I said that in a meeting. He said, but in desire of ages, I said, it's a gift. I told him, well, yeah, but you better keep reading. Because he gives us all the provisions for it as a gift. 
but we have to earn our character. And so I I had to, in front of that whole group, come up with an illustration because he was really making a scene. <laughs> he said, no, it's a character. I said, well, I'm sorry, but do you have it? Do you have the character of God? Because he gave it to you. And he, I said, you don't have it because you expect him to give it to you, and he's never going to do it. You better get this figured out. Suppose that I'm going to a university and I know they have finals for all the courses. And I'm diligent in going to school and studying and doing everything they say. But two weeks before the final, I get sick. Really sick. And I can't even get to the finals. I'm so sick. Let alone study for them. <laughs> So, after all of this time and all this study and all this effort, I've been wiped out by sickness. I cannot get to my finals. I can't take them. I can't study for them. What am I going to do? Well, I haven't figured out. I'm going to ask you to take my finals for me. <laughs> yeah. Would you do that for me? You take my finals and I'll be okay. I haven't gone to school for three years to get to those ones. I haven't studied. I have no idea what the teacher said. I have read not a single book. How am I going to take your finals? Well, just take them. What good is that going to do? I do not have your mind to work with. And that's exactly why God can give us character as a gift. It's got to be our mind based on what we have learned, what we have decided, what we have lived, and what we know. And nobody else in the universe is like that except <laughs> me. <laughs> so God can only take my character to heaven if I'm going to go at all. And she says here, our character must be the same kind as Jesus. Now we have something to work with. Because we can do it. We can have our individual, unique character, but it's the same kind that Jesus had. And that's what we want. So we are starting to learn some things that are very important. It says, the Lord says of those who believe in him, and that's who, those who receive him, I will dwell in them. Who? How do you make that work with the Trinity? How can a Trinitarian say, I believe Jesus lives in me, he himself. They can't say it. The Trinity doesn't believe that. The Trinity says the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are inseparable. That's a basic teaching of the Trinity. So if Jesus lives in me, there has to be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit living in me. The whole God is inside me, according to the Trinity people. So Jesus shouldn't have said I. He should have said we. You see what's wrong? Jesus never talked like a Trinitarian because he wasn't one. And Ellen White never talked like one. She's writing this book and she says, he says, I will dwell in you. There's no way you can get Trinity out of the spirit of prophecy. There's just no way. It is absolute foolishness to try to take some statements and pervert them and misuse them and misquote them. To come up with something that Alan White never believed and the Bible never says. So we need to spot all these things that they're everywhere. I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God. Oh, so Jesus is our God. He's our creator. They shall be my people. We are his church. Okay? So Jesus is everything to us. 
The Father has handed all of us over to Jesus to say. And Jesus is the only one who can get it done. She talks a little bit about the ladder that Jacob saw. And of course, Jesus is that ladder. And the angels walk up and down. I hope you have the quotations put together about Jesus being the only way that God communicates with us. He's the ladder. He's the only communication. But the angels walk up and down that ladder. So they're part of the communication. They bring the Spirit of the Father to us. They bring the Spirit of Jesus to us. They're involved in as big a way as can be. But it's Jesus. We mustn't, it's always Jesus. That's why that first love is important. If we lose that first love, we have lost the foundation of the whole gospel, of everything. We must have that first love constantly. He, she says it this way. If that ladder, <coughs> which reaches from here to there, to the throne of God, if that ladder had failed by a single step, just one step missing, by a single step of reaching the earth, we should have been lost. So the work of Jesus is perfect. It's absolutely perfect. If he misses one little thing, it's all gone. He took our nature. That was one of the big steps. He took our nature. So, when Jesus is walking around the earth, when people looked at him walking around there in that, those, that Palestine area, do you know of anybody that pointed to him and said, Oh, look, there's the perfect man. Did anybody ever point to Jesus and say that? Oh, look, there's the perfect man. Why not? Because he looked just like everybody else. <laughs> there was nothing to look at and say there's the perfect man <laughs> so if he looked like us he's proving something that people that look like us can live like him <laughs> that's Romans the 8th chapter she's, she's heading a lot of ground here and she's dealing with the Sermon on the Mount. He took our nature and overcame that we, through taking his nature, may overcome. So there's a meeting of the natures. He took ours, we take his. And that's exactly why he came, was to give us his nature. So there's only one plan of salvation. Receive Jesus through His Spirit and then you're like Him when He was walking around on this earth. He lived a sinless life. There it is. There it is. Page 311, it really hammers home. One little page, she just hits it so hard. But this is the only plan of salvation there is. And we never heard it in church because people in the church don't believe in this plan of salvation anymore. This is Seventh-day Adventism. And there's no trinity in it. You cannot teach the real Seventh-day Adventist doctrine and hold on to the trinity. It can't be done. I don't know how many people have arrived at that fact yet. But I can show it to you over and over in the spirit of prophecy. We, as a people, are in big, big trouble because we have no foundation, no basis for the doctrines we still teach that are halfway still Seventh-day Adventists because we have lost the spiritual content. We don't know what the real spirit is in it. He reaches us by His humanity and He reaches heaven by His divinity. 
He bids us by faith in a third person coming down from heaven to deal with us. Is that what he said? Did he ever say that? There's another God I'm going to send to you so he'll take care of it instead of me. No, that's not anywhere. In reality, that's pure fable. What he said was to have faith in him. He himself, Jesus, only. Okay? Have faith in him. If we have faith in him, then we can attain to the glory of the character of God. There it is. In black and white. Be perfect as your Father means. Have a character like God. And so Jesus then tells us the thing we need to know and tend to miss. There's only one way you can do this. The source of all of this is the Father Himself. We must have the Spirit of the Father. Not one third of the Godhead as people talk about, but the full Godhead of the Father. He is the Godhead. He is the Supreme Deity. There are not two Godheads. There are not two or three people who make up a committee who are in the Godhead. No, the Godhead is a person. It is the person of the Father. He is the Godhead. He gave that Godhead to His Son. So it is in His Son. Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead in Himself because the Father gave it to Him. That. That means that there are two deities. That doesn't mean there's two supreme gods. It only means there are two deities. There's a father and there's a son. And a father and son never become one person. It's never happened. It can't happen. Okay? So, God is the source of all righteousness. Jesus has that righteousness and He is the one that gives it to us. The Father does not give us the righteousness directly. It has to be in Christ. Jesus is the only way we get any of this. Alright, this chapter is really a heavy chapter. Now, it's taken us three meetings just to get this far and we're actually only about three quarters of the way through it. <laughs> This is a tremendous chapter, the Sermon on the Mount. Let's let's keep looking at some things here. In prayer, she says, let the soul commune with God. In fasting, go not with the head bowed down and the heart filled with thoughts of self. The heart of the Pharisee is barren and profitless soil in which no seeds of divine life can flourish. Last time we read in this chapter that she says the Pharisee is a bigot. Do you remember what the Noah Webster Dictionary defined for the word bigot? A person who hangs on to a creed. That's a bigot. I think you ought to go read that in a dictionary sometime and realize what a creed does to a church. It's done it to ours. A Pharisee. The righteousness of a Pharisee is that of a bigot. I'm not going to continue that now. You ought to think about it. Read these words in dictionaries and, think, and find out what it means here. 
So it says the heart of a person is barren and profitless. The seeds of divine life cannot flourish there. It's only those who yield themselves unreservedly to God. Ah, no reservation, nothing held back, nothing put in the way, nothing higher than God. That's idolatry. When a person does all the way unreserved, that is acceptable. Those are the words in his book. That is acceptable. Fellowship with God, through fellowship with God, men become workers with him in presenting his character to mankind. So that is our work. Our work is not to try to get saved. We can't do anything to save ourselves. We can't earn anything from God to be saved. Justification is a free gift that the Father and the Son worked out between themselves. We had nothing to do with it. Nothing at all. And we will never have anything to do with it. It's between them. Redemption. The price of redemption is an absolute total gift. But, in order to get the benefits of it, ah, there's the rub. We must understand that the gift is on condition of our knowing we need it. <laughs> okay? We need it! <laughs> and we are willing, in proportion to the value of the gift, return something in gratitude. Not to earn anything, but in acknowledgement. What is it that I need to do for God to show I acknowledge His great gift? What is the gift, by the way? It's not just eternal life. What is the gift? It's the life of His Son. His <clears throat> own Son gave his life. He gave everything he could give. There's nothing left for Jesus to give. He gave all that he had. And so what does he ask from us? All that we have. And that's really not a bad trade at all. My all is only about that big. <laughs> Just a little teeny all. And his is infinity. He says, I gave my all. Will you give me your all? Well, I'm not sure it's worth it. I'm kind of having fun here in my evil ways. I mean, do I really have to give up my pizzas? Well, you don't have to. But they're going to kill you if you keep eating them. <laughs> Isn't it strange the way we think? Steps to Christ. Somewhere around page 44, she says, God asks us for our all. And what is it that we give up when we give all? Our darling sins. That's what we, we give when we give all. A sin polluted our what we're giving all. <laughs> a sin polluted heart and we give all and, and we don't even want to do it. We want to get, give up our, our sin polluted heart. Our darling that loves sin polluted heart and we like it. She says, I'm ashamed to hear it. I'm ashamed to write it. Well, she didn't say that in this hour of ages, but she said it in Steps to Christ. The attributes of the character of Christ are imparted and the image of the divine begins to shine forth. The faces of men and women who walk and work with God express the peace of heaven. They have Christ's joy, the joy of being a blessing to humanity. They are trusted to do His work in His name. 
and trust it to do his work in his name. And you know, angels, they look at us and they look at Christ and they look at the plans of it and they just wonder, and how, how, how is this possible that those sinful little creatures are loved by God the way he loves them and he can transform them to become like him? How does that happen? <laughs> Yeah, angels look at us and, just, and they just say, Man, how does God get this done? <laughs> she says, the Bible religion is not a dash of color here and there. That's kind of interesting in that. It's just not something that you see every now and then in a person. She says, when, when you make a, a painting, you don't have a painting by splashing a color here and there. <laughs> or even when you want to dye the cloth. That's better. When you want to dye the cloth. You don't throw some red dye on a piece of gray cloth and say, I dyed it. There it is. That would be all splotchy. That's nothing. <laughs> There's only one way to dye the cloth. <laughs> Dip the whole thing. And don't miss anything. Now, you have a dyed cloth. And it's interesting to me, she uses the word dipped. In the Greek language, the word dipped is baptizo. To be baptized. Totally immersed. Dipped. <laughs> there are scholars who deny that, but to me, that's what the Greek language says. and It says it to a lot of people, including, I think, the pioneers. When we are immersed, we're dipped. We have a whole new color. There are no splotches, no parts that were missed. We were dipped. <laughs> I am a Christian. You see what you're saying with those three words, or four words? <laughs> All right. Now I'm going to read you a sentence that I have in a different color than anything else I use. It's a special color for truths that are absolutely amazing if we can understand them. Here's the one sentence. He who desires to know the truth must be willing to accept all that it reveals. That's when you stop playing games and you know it. When you study truth and no matter what comes, it's you. It's your new life. It's your new understanding of what life really is. It's truth. If it is truth, you take it all no matter what it means. All of it. That's a tremendous little sentence. It can make no compromise with error. To be wavering and half-hearted in allegiance to truth is to choose the darkness of error and satanic delusion. Now, I didn't say that. That's in the book, Desire of Ages, page 312. 312.4. If anybody thinks they can play around with, with doctrines they're not sure about and just because a church says it's true, even though they don't know for sure, they better think about it carefully. Because the spirit of prophecy flat out says there's darkness in that and worse than that, it is satanic delusion. Either it's the truth or it isn't the truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. There is no halfway point with that statement. It's either Jesus or it isn't. I am the truth. And of course, he also added a couple things. The other one that most people don't think about is he says, I am the way. He didn't say, I'm going to show you the way. 
He didn't say, I'm going to teach you the way. He said, I am the way. I'm the only way. You have to have my life in you. I am the way. <laughs> it doesn't matter what we believe. It doesn't matter what kind of faith we think we have. Faith isn't going to save us. What we believe is not going to save us. We have to have Jesus. We have to have His Spirit. He Himself, not a third fake God, but Jesus Himself. I am the way. Period. If one sin is cherished in the soul, or one wrong practice retained in the life, the whole being is contaminated. In Christ Optic Lessons, what is it, 3.16, she says, To be almost saved is to be all wholly lost. Those are, why should we wonder about these statements? <laughs> they all make sense. They're all true. They can't be played with. They can't be modified. God is never going to change. To be almost saved is to be wholly lost. And then she says a, 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 an Adventist statement. Nobody else in the Christian world can understand this statement. All who have chosen God's service are to rest in His care. <laughs> rest. Now, in the Bible, in Matthew, it says, I will give you rest, but that's not the flavor in the Greek. In the original language, the way it comes out is, I will rest you. <clears throat> Do you see the difference? If he gives me rest, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to mess it up. <laughs> yeah. He says, here, I give you rest. Oh, okay, thank you. And I'm going to find out some way to mess it up. But if he says, I will rest you, that's him doing something. And I, I can't mess that up. He's doing it. And I'm cooperating with him, but he is the one doing it. And I have to remember, I have to completely depend on him for everything. When I think I'm doing something to get this done, I'm in big trouble. Our, our dependence is completely on him to cooperate with him. Always. Then on 313.2, it says he longs to see his children reveal a character after his similitude. Now, I think we have touched on it before. That's the reason why he hasn't come back. Christ Optic Lesson 69. When his character is perfectly reproduced in his children. Then he will come to claim them as his own. You know, our books contain a treasure. Our books say things that if the whole church could get a hold of and start living in it, we would show the world something it's never seen before. But we as a church are so illiterate when it comes to the spirit of prophecy in the Bible. We're like the Sunday keeping churches and we don't even know it. And our schools teach Sunday keeping. I'm sorry to say that so that everybody can hear it, but that's the way it is. We are teaching Sunday keeping to the Seventh day Adventists and we are just tearing up the whole plan of God. We need to get into these books and start seeing what they really say and then start living there no matter what anybody else thinks about it. 
Be not therefore anxious for the morrow. Oh, now we're on the next part of how his disciples lived. Now remember this section we're in is about the workers of God, those who are Christians. Before he was talking to the people on how to become one, what it means, how happy they would be if they would know what Christianity is and to live that way, to receive Jesus. But now we're talking to disciples. What they do as actual Christians. Be not anxious for the morrow. It's amazing that he has to say that to us. Because nobody has ever lived in tomorrow. Nobody has ever lived there. Tomorrow is always out there. And so he says, don't be anxious about it. I can't help you tomorrow. God will never help us for tomorrow. It's always now. And so... The devil has taught us something that's not in God's kingdom. It's called, I'm going to anticipate this, and I'm going to get myself good and worried. And I'm going to worry myself right out of the hands of Christ. Because all the solutions I think about are not his solutions. Now, I know it's easy to talk about these things, but we need to start learning how to live there. God does not make mistakes. And if something goes different than what we think it should have gone, guess who was right, him or us? And it means that if something went wrong, he knew all about it before it happened, and he didn't let it happen because he couldn't help it. He let it come because we need it. Because we're not learning something quick enough. So he says, I will let you go through this experience so you see what you're really made out of and so you know that I am in control and you're not and the only way this is going to work out is if you let me work things out with your cooperation. (laughs) And we're all learning this. It's very difficult because we were all of us built a whole different way. As a matter of fact, we had a double whammy. We were born in the United States. and the United States, you always watch out for number one. And I did it my way. <laughs> we're Americans. That's not too bad. We're Americans. No, we belong to a better country. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. So these next two sentences are uh, a real rebuke to us. He, God, does not give his children all the directions for their life journey at once. Lest they should become confused. (laughs) If you told me everything I'm going to do in my life, what good would it do me? (laughs) He tells them just as much as they can remember and perform. Now, how much do you suppose that is? Maybe to the end of today? Maybe? (laughs) Maybe? If any of you lack wisdom for today, Ellen White added that to the scriptures. (laughs) If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God. She put in the word, for today. (laughs) Just for today. And then he moves on. Judge not that you be not judged. Don't think you're better than other people. Don't think you're smart enough to figure out what they're thinking, what their motives are. You just can't do that. You don't know those things. And if you try to do it and you judge them based on what you think you know, God says, okay, if you're smart enough to do that, I'm going to judge you exactly the same way. Now, that's absolutely horrible. I can't think of anything worse than God judging me based on the way I see the world. He says, if that's what you want, if you want that to be your judgment, I can do it because I know exactly what you're doing. 
I know how you're doing it and, and why you're doing it. I can plug that all in and do exactly the same thing for you. Ooh, I think there's going to be some unhappy people. Yeah. Some really unhappy people. It says, if you're doing that to people, I'm going to have to judge you the way I judge Satan because that's where you learned it. He's the accuser of the brethren. <laughs> he is the accuser. So he says, if you're going to examine somebody, guess who? Yeah. Examine yourselves. Yeah, that's where you go. Examine yourselves. Prove your own selves. Don't prove anybody else. If you do that, then I'll judge you my way, which is the right way, the correct way. I can't go through the whole Sermon on the Mount. I realize now it would take us weeks and weeks and weeks. Either today we'll, we'll try to wrap this reflection up. But I want to read you half a sentence here that I started out and never finished as we began the meeting. It says, Though the eternal reward is not bestowed because of our merit, yet the reward will be proportionate to the work that's been done through the grace of Christ. So if a person has never done anything in the kingdom of God to win soul, never, that's the reward they're going to get. It's for nothing. Nothing makes nothing. How can Jesus say to a person, Oh, come in, faithful servant. Well done. How can he say that if I haven't done anything? Yeah, that's the run. How can Jesus say well done if nothing was ever done? All of it fits. All of it. It's all perfect. God's plan. And it can't be faked. Self is shifting sand. If you build upon human theories and inventions, your house will fall. Now, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that statement. If you build on the Trinity... Oh, did I say that? I I think I did. That's an invention. That's a fable. That's a theory. And people who base their religion on that idea, their house is going to fall. Period. Christianity has not come to grips with any of this yet. And the poor Seventh-day Adventist people, we have not looked at these things carefully enough to know what God is trying to tell us. We're not dealing with doctrines here. We're dealing with the kingdom of God. We're, we're dealing with the reality of His universe. Nobody can change the rules in His kingdom. We either understand things and come to grips with him and his ways out of love or we just will not be a part of it. By the winds of temptation the tempest of trial it will be swept away. Now I know that people don't like contradictions to their ideas based on their understanding of words. But did you just see what she said here? Did she say, God is going to knock your house down? Did she say that? That he's going to come and do a big judgment on you and he's going to step on your house and that'll be the end of your house. That God's going to take vengeance on you. That he's going to get mad at you and really take care of the problem and get rid of you forever. Is that what she said? No, she said that house falls down. Why? The winds of temptation. 
Now, God didn't give you a temptation. Satan is the one who gives us temptations. God allows them if we choose to live with those things. But there's always a price to pay. And it's not because God says, I'm going to get you in the end. That's not the price. The price is the temptation has consequences if we do it. And the consequences are there without God doing anything. He has set up the powers, all the powers. The water cycle, the hydrological cycle. He set it up so that there's evaporation. There's clouds. There's motion. There's wind. There's condensation. The cycle is completed by the water and the sky's coming back down to the earth. And there's great power in that. And if you want to see the power, look at a monsoon sometime. A hurricane. It's those little drops of water. God has made all those powers. Fantastic powers that we call the power of nature. Those powers stay in control. Because he maintains balances. It's all, today is pretty, the water's in the air doing this right now. That water that does hurricanes, it's right there. But God is taking care of it. He's saying, you stay there, you stay there, you maintain here, and everything is fine. As long as God is keeping all that working. But when a person chooses temptation instead of God, that changes things. That changes. The powers are still there. They're still operating. And if we insist on God staying out of our life and we push him clear away, who's going to control those powers? Well, there's somebody out there who's waiting. <laughs> yeah. He says, don't let me add those powers. Let me use them for a while. And God says, I don't want you to do that. But if they give you the right, if they choose you, and they want you instead of me, I have to honor that. I gave them freedom of choice. And I have to do what they say because I gave them that right. And when Satan gets a hold of this stuff, now we have problems. Yeah. It's the same powers, but a different hand working on So, I don't want to get into that too far. There are people who really get upset with some of this. But let me tell you what she says here. By the winds of temptation, the tempest of trial, it would be swept away. Why did the trial allow this to happen? The people chose wrong. They chose incorrectly. And they pushed the hand away that makes everything work correctly. We will talk more about this as we go along. We are just touching the edges of the character of God. Who is he really? Now, she says it over and over again, but we miss it. Jesus says it over and over again, but we're not listening to, to what he's really saying. All right, let's finish this. Matthew seven twenty four and 25. Everyone therefore which heareth these words of mine. Sermon on the Mount. Okay. We, we've just been through it. Everyone which heareth and doeth them <laughs> and doeth shall be likened unto a wise man which built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house 
and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. Keep everything with Jesus. Everything. All the time. And it doesn't matter about the wrong choices of other people. If we have made the right choices, we have the God who is always in control of all the powers He's made. Always. These are tremendous things she has written in this chapter. There's a lot more here that we didn't discuss, but you read it carefully. See what you come up with. Okay, I think we'll we'll end with that right now because that's the chapter. I don't want to start going back into things. So Jesus basically told us everything he says to do we can do exactly the same way that he was able to do it. He had the spirit of his father in him. And his humanity lived a true human life in the power and spirit of God himself, the father. And he said, I will do the same thing for you. I will give you that same spirit from myself so that you can live that life that I live.